Hi, everybody. It's Glenda McDonald, the story finder. And here with us today are Tina Crossfield in the bottom right at, uh, from Crossfield Publishing, Marianne Jones, Joanne Cully, Jill Martin Boutelier, and Phyllis Humby. And these are all authors of Crossfield Publishing that are Jill Martin Boutelier. And oh, we've got a little feedback issue. I'm going to mute Tina for a second. Okay. You got it? Okay. Yep. We got it sorted. This uh, th this is what happens. It's a live event. So uh, just to give you a little warning in advance, if something goes wrong, we're just going to go with the flow and 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 that's what it'll be. OK, so um, so just to start off, um, I've been working with Tina for for several years and some of the authors I've worked with personally and I'm just getting to know some of the other ones um, a little bit better now. But uh, from what I've read in excerpts, and from what I've personally edited in some cases or worked with them on their social media, they're all, everybody's on social media. So go to the Crossfield Publishing Facebook page and there are links and updates about all of the authors as well as me on my Glenda McDonald um, page. So anyway, uh, so because this is being recorded live, it means that if you can't stay for the whole event, don't worry about it you can pop in and pop out you can put your comments in the bottom just be aware that your comments are public because people don't have to be um, a part of youtube in order to comment i think that the system asks people to just give their permission before they they publish something but uh, but anyway so i'm not going to say too much more because this is really tina's show and i'm just the uh not just but i am the producer the story finder hashtag the story finder and um, I'll be popping in and out and bear with me because we've got so many authors with us today that I'm gonna be changing who's on screen. And and uh, anyway, so here we go over to Tina. I think that's, uh, I think I've covered everything. Tina? Yes. Hi. Yes, when we need help, we say, Glenda, where are you? <laughs> Hi, and welcome to everyone watching and listening to us live on the Crossfield Publishing YouTube channel. As part of the Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, we in the St. Mary's Public Library Board acknowledges with gratitude and respect the traditional lands of the Anishabewake and the Adawandaruk nations. May we honor their teachings. Thank you for joining us. You're in for a very special hour with our guest panel of four distinct authors of fiction novels. With me in the studio this evening are Jill Martin Boutelier from Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, and in Ontario, Marianne Jones from Thunder Bay, Phyllis Humby from Thedford in Lambton Shores Municipality, and Joanne Cully from Peterborough. A special hello to members of the Napanee Literary Group as well. So glad you could attend. After a brief introduction, we will dive into some thought-provoking questions and move around our panel. Perhaps you as a reader or writer may have struggled with some of these issues before. How will our authors handle these questions? I'm now pleased to give you a little background on our special guests. Jill Martin Boutelier. Her most recent book, From Thistles to Cowpies, artfully blends memoir and biography in a touching narrative of two immigrant families who settle in Saskatchewan in the early 20th century. Leaving the world of instant connection behind, modern readers enter the portals of the past through the eyes of those who lived it. Jill is a consultant historian for the National Film Board and White Gate Films. Her book, Sable Island in Black and White, a pictorial book of life on Sable Island in the 1900s, was the winner of the 2017 Atlantic Book Award for nonfiction. Before she began writing full time, Jill was an educator on Nova Scotia's South Shore, serving as the last principal of Lunenburg Academy. She sits on the board of Friends of Sable Island Society as director of education. Joanne Cully, 
Her work has appeared in the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, Peterborough Examiner, Kawartha Cottage, Legion Magazine, Our Canada, and in several anthologies. She received the In Celebration of Women Media Award for her documentary, Be My Baby. In Claudette on the Keys, Joanne gives us a detailed glimpse into a little known period in history from the unique perspective of a resourceful female musician who draws inspiration from her movie star hero, Claudette Colbert, whenever she finds herself in a tough spot. Her previous book, Love in the Air, Second World War Letters, was written in 2015 after she, after she discovered over 600 letters her parents wrote during the Second World War. Her father was a musician in the RCAF and her mother worked at the TTC in a job that would normally have been done by a man. In the book, she combined excerpts from their letters, imagined scenes and historical background. It was well received with much media attention as it was released on the 70th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Mary Ann Jones. Mary Ann was born and raised in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Her latest book, Maud and Me, is a novel set in the 1980s in a small northwestern Ontario mining town. The main character, a middle-aged minister's wife, has a secret. She receives ghostly visits from Lucy Maud Montgomery, also a minister's wife and author of Anne of Green Gables. Mary Ann's work has appeared in Room, Wascana Review, Canadian Living and Reader's Digest, and has won awards from the Canadian Authors Association, Writer's Digest and others. Her As Told To memoir, The Girl Who Wouldn't Die, won the 2015 Word Alive Press Publishing Contest. Much of her writing celebrates the unique beauty of Northwestern Ontario. And Marianne is currently working on a mystery set in Thunder Bay. Phyllis L. Humby. Phyllis's first novel, Old Broad Road, was released in the fall of 2020. It's about a woman who flees 2,000 miles from home and stubbornly adapts to the unique culture and dialect of Newfoundland. In a roller coaster psychological play of events, she finally reconciles with her estranged family, but it's a long and rocky road. Although Phyllis's passion for writing began with longer works, her short stories, often scheming, twisted, spooky, have appeared in anthologies and journals in Canada, the US and the UK. She is a past second place winner in the Your McMurray Magazine National Competition and a recipient of the Bonnie Pete Award for Best Short Story at the Crime Writers Conference in Toronto. In 2013, Phyllis's humorous story, Delusional Dates, won her a place as a fringe reader at the Eden, Eden Mills Writers Festival, located near Guelph, Ontario. And her first book, Hazards of the Trade, a boutique owner's intimate reveal of the 1980s and 90s lingerie boom, was released in April 2020. Phyllis has built up a loyal following through her writing blog and Facebook page, in addition to her monthly column, Up Close and Personal, in First Monday Magazine. And so now it's time for some questions and uh, comments can be placed uh, in the YouTube feed. Uh, we will keep an eye on those. But um, I'd like to begin with Jill. Okay, Jill, in your early works on Sable Island, where nothing blocks storms, 
One scene describes a thunderstorm as if you were there with your characters in their attic bedroom. What was the source of this imagery? I think the, the first key is for authors to be observant. And I was writing a scene where the two sisters, they were 14 and 17 at the time, and they had lost their mother. And they were in their attic bedroom. They were sort of holding on to each other because on Sable Island, you can imagine what a thunderstorm would be like. And I thought, how can I make the reader feel like they're hearing and, and seeing and sensing what that must have been like? Because the terror outside was like the loss of their mother. And they had the inner terror of that terrible um, feeling of grief and a loss. So in my home here in Lunenburg, I was, it was a really bad snowstorm. And I was looking out the window and you could see the gable of the roof and there were snowflakes just flying around like crazy. And they sort of made me think about Catherine wheels of fireworks. And I thought that is exactly what I want to create. And so with that in mind, I went to my computer and was writing it. Would you say that the immediacy of capturing that idea was important? Absolutely, because it not only was um, a physical thing, it was also paramount to how these six children were now going to move on without their mother. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Joanne. Joanne, how do you feel about blending fact and fiction? Well, all my book, Claudette on the Keys, is inspired by the real lives of my grandparents, uh, who are a popular uh, two piano, four hands team in the 1930s. Harry and Ida, whose stage name was Claudette, um, had shows on many Toronto radio stations, such as CFRB and CKCL, as well as playing live in theaters and they were described at the time as Toronto's premier two piano artists. The book opens in the winter of 1936 at the height of the Great Depression when the musical couple are laid off from their weekly radio program due to a pullout by their sponsor, uh, Sheriff Smarmalade. After their home is repossessed, desperation sets in. But when Claudette plays free of charge at a charity concert at Shays Hippodrome, she happens to meet Jack a very charming British uh, talent agent who invites her and uh, Harry to come to London to play. She, he was so impressed by her rendition of uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue on stage. And while in London, she experiences firsthand the rise of fascism uh, there as well as in Germany. And whenever she's struggling, as you said, she uh, draws inspiration from her movie star hero, uh, Claudette Colbert. So I've taken the germ of that story to create a fictionalized account of their time overseas. And I took real people who were involved in Harry and Claudette's lives, such as uh, Hollywood actress, uh, Bibi Daniels, who sang while the piano duo accompanied her, and well-known actor and producer, Raymond Massey, whose play The, the Orchard Walls was um, happening in London at the time they were there. And I try to be faithful to the personal personality of these characters and the events of the time. And real historical figures such as Sir Oswald Mosley and Dr. Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi, appear as themselves. And um, others are loosely based on real people and their lives. Um, but even though the book's fiction, I felt it was important to stay true to the historical events and the real activities of the characters. Okay, thank you. Do you think there was any hesitation about going to Europe at that time? Yeah, well, there there wasn't uh, feelings of war in 1936, but certainly by the time they came back, um, all the residents were issued gas masks. So that's when they decided to return because the, um, yeah, the rise of fascism was getting quite threatening. Mm -hmm. That would have been difficult to forecast. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, um, Marianne. Hi, Marianne. <laughs> um, 
You've been you've been writing across the genres for a while. Yep. Um, you've written children's books, a cozy mystery, an as told to memoir, and a poetry collection. Maud and Me is your first literary novel. What led you to write in this genre, and how was it different from writing your other books? Well, I guess there were two things that led me to write it. One is that it was always my dream to write a literary novel, um, because those were the kinds of books I loved to read. And uh, the other was that I, I had the strangest, uh, well, I won't call it a vision, but it was very strong image come to me a number of years ago of a minister's wife digging in her garden, putting in plants and looking up and seeing Lucy Maud Montgomery standing there, except that Lucy Maud Montgomery had died decades earlier. And this was such a strong impression. I grabbed my pen and started writing it and uh, it became the beginning of this novel. Now, as far as uh, how is it different, I would say that I found it the most challenging genre to write in. Mystery novels have a certain, they have certain um, expected patterns to happen. And you know that there's going to be a bad guy and you know that there's going to be danger and you know that it's going to be resolved at the end. And that's one of the satisfying things about mystery novels is that we know it's going to work out in the end. They're going to solve the mystery. With a literary novel, all bets are off. It's more like real life. So to try and create something that in one sense was not like real life because people don't typically have a dead person from the past show up. But in every other way, it had to have that ring of authenticity that people would feel as though, yes, I've been to that place. I, I can totally believe in this character. And I was, I felt a lot of internal pressure to, to get it right. So I found that was the most challenging book I've, I've attempted up to this point. That's interesting that you that you had that experience of of seeing an image. That's that's very yes. Powerful. I wish it happened to me all the time. It would it would be just so helpful. <laughs> but <laughs> it was kind of a one off, and I just felt it so strongly. I felt that I have to do something with this. This I don't know why it's important, but it's important. It's important. Yes. Okay, let's go to Phyllis. Hi, Phyllis. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, is it imperative that the main character be likable? Okay. Um, a little bit of controversy about that. But personally, I don't believe it is imperative that the main characters be likable because it's more important for me to have a realistic character. And realistic characters have flaws that some might not appreciate. Uh, when I think of Old Broad Road and the main character, Sylvia Kramer, uh, this poor lady experiences a devastating shock that just sets her reeling. And she uh, escapes her home in Toronto and, and travels to the Far East. And by Far East, I mean Newfoundland. And she... Uh, sets up home there and uh, doesn't even contact her family or anything. So some readers might find this unforgivable that she could actually leave her grown children and uh, leave her grandchildren um, and decide to live so far away from them without even letting them know ahead of time. But um, I think a lot of readers, as they follow her journey through, see her redeeming qualities and probably appreciate what she's been through. Um, and, and many readers can relate to what's happening with Sylvia Kramer and um, can forgive her and maybe even uh, feel validated themselves. So I don't think they all have to be likable. 
but um, they must have some redeeming qualities and be relatable in some way to the reader. Does that pretty much answer? Yes, it does. Thank okay. you. It does. Great. Okay. Uh, we're moving back to Jill. <clears throat> okay, Jill. Um, how do you place your characters into an actual event that happened before you were alive, as if it were in the present without making it just all about information? Mm -hmm. Well, like Joanne, um, when you have letters from that time period or you do research or you read newspapers, um, in one of the scenes leading up to World War II, we're in 1933, 1936, 1939, and the fear for people in Saskatchewan was that they would probably have to enlist. And one of their dear friends, young man, uh, Bill Zuff, did enlist. And many of those letters I have that he wrote back to my parents. So I was able to understand what he was feeling when he was in Africa, when he came back. But to make it real, rather than just say, this is what happened, have them having their morning coffee and listening to the radio and hearing what was going on and then having a discussion about it or a conversation about it. And then you feel like you're there. Um, it's real. And there is some white space, as I say, <laughs> white space on the page. And it doesn't feel like you've got long, thick paragraphs. Or when they go curling and they have a beer after and they sit and they wonder, are you going to enlist? And so you find the feeling of the characters at that time and how, how scary, how threatening it must have been. But it seems more real, mm -hmm. authentic. Mm -hmm. It is it because it was captured was captured at the time. Yeah, yeah. Thank goodness for letters and for archives. You bet. Many many hours in archives. I've been. <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of archives, we're going back to Joanne. <laughs> you did a lot of historical research for the time period. Um, what was the breadth of that? Yes, indeed. I did quite a bit of research on what was happening um, in the 1930s on both sides of the Atlantic, in Toronto, um, in particular about the effects of the Great Depression, things like the unemployment rate at the time, and also in, in England and in Europe at that time. And I wove the actual events into the fictional plot. Um, I wanted to base the story and what was true and actually happening in 1936 and 37 when the story takes place. I wanted to get the historical facts correct. Um, for instance, I researched passports for women at that time and found out that they were just listed on their husband's passport. Um, they didn't have their own document. Um, plus, I had the real life passport for Harry and Claudette and that information helped me to formulate the plot about um, how she gets into trouble for traveling on her own in Europe. And uh, yes, there was a question from J.M. Montgomery. I did go to England to research, in particular to London, England, fortunately, just before the pandemic hit, um, just so I could walk around the streets to make the characters' movements um, in London more real and, and to visit the spots where um, Harry and Claudette performed. Um, for instance, at the Phoenix Theater, where the uh, coronation concert for King George VI, who um, took over the throne when his brother abdicated. Um, and the interior, I found, was much the same as it would have been in 1937, which was pretty amazing. And I read a lot about Radio Luxembourg, which was an upstart commercial radio station that was challenging the uh, monopoly of the BBC at that time, because the BBC um, insisted that there be no commercials on the radio. But uh, Radio Luxembourg got around that rule by recording the shows at their studios in London and then transporting the discs down to uh, Luxembourg, where they were broadcast back into England on the most powerful transmitter in Europe which then became coveted by the Nazis. Um, 
and they in, in fact took it over in 1940 to broadcast their propaganda. So I wove a plot about um, Claudette and her friend Bibi Daniels uh, ferrying the discs down to Luxembourg uh, where they become aware of the Nazi presence in the station. And I visited uh, the British Library Music Archives to reach, research the shows that, that aired on Radio Luxembourg. And I found references to um, Harry and Claudette's uh, shows in this uh, pictorial magazine. And I'm pleased that readers have noticed that research and have commented on the accuracy of the book. In fact, um, Canadian author Genevieve Graham said that uh, Music and hope navigate the treacherous waters of the pre-war period in this detailed, well-researched novel about perseverance and the power of self-discovery. So that comment made me feel that I had uh, done my job. <laughs> that must have been so exciting when you found mm -hmm. that, that link mm -hmm. of, uh, in, in the, um, the Luxembourg uh, recordings. Yeah, yeah, it was Very quite uh, quite amazing to see the picture of Claudette there in the in the magazine, and yeah, mm -hmm. it sort of brought everything to reality. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're on to Marianne. Okay. Okay, and uh, how did you research the character of Lucy Maud Montgomery? I know there's a very interesting story there. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, like most uh, Canadian girls, I grew up reading her books and I read biographies at the time to know more about her since I knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, but when, after having this image come to me and writing the first chapter, I ordered the complete set of her selected journals. Uh, here's here's one of them. This is, I think, the final one. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, there, uh, you can see that there's five of them. And they were uh, edited by Drs. Mary Rubio and Elizabeth Waterston uh, from the University of Guelph, who made her their life's work. Also, uh, um, Mary Rubio wrote this recent biography, which is probably the best and most thorough, called uh, The Gift of Wings. And it's a wonderful uh, biography. But the benefit of, of reading those journals, although they're very dense, because they cover from the time she was a young woman, a young author, she very early became successful with that of Green Gables and became a world famous author uh, right to the time of her death and writing in her journals was her her release because all day long she had to be what other people demanded of her she was a minister's wife so she was expected to behave a certain way all the time um, as a writer People had come to expect her to write very sunny, lovely, happy stories. Um, she also worked very hard, like most people in those days. She had a, she lived in the country. She had a garden. She had chickens to feed. She had to bake and cook and and preserve and do all the things that housewives had to do. So she had an absolutely exhausting schedule and the emotional exhaustion of having to always be on, always be performing. Plus, she had to take care of a husband who suffered from severe depression, and she had to keep that hidden, keep it a secret, but try her best to take care of him. So it was, in many ways, a lonely life. There were very few people she could be real to. So at nighttime, after everybody had gone to bed, she would write in her journals. And that's where we would see her real thoughts and her frustrations, as well as her joys. And it's um, it's it, it's a, a fascinating picture. You get a real glimpse of what the times were like, what the demands on her were like, and what she was like as a person. And she was a person of great 
wit and insight and intelligence and also she what what is not known as well was that not only did her husband suffer from depression but so did she and unfortunately she the doctor prescribed Veronal, which was a barbiturate at the time, to help her husband sleep. And she began taking it. And unfortunately, they required larger and larger doses. And Veronal barbiturates are a depressant. So instead of relieving their depression, it was, uh, it was actually increasing it and making life tougher. But there are many incidents that I have taken from her journals in the book where she is telling Nicole, the main character, about meeting the Governor General, meeting very important people, uh, Nellie Klung and famous, uh, famous feminists of the day, and being a member of the Auth Canadian Authors Association and, and all kinds of fascinating things and humorous things in there. So um, I found it was, uh, it was great. And, and it wasn't just to get the facts straight. It was also because I wanted to represent her accurately, to get her voice. When I had to make up the things she would say, I had to make sure they were in character with the woman that I was reading about in the journals. So um, yes, I hope I did it faithfully. That's very moving um, to hear all of that. Thank you. Okay, um, Phyllis. Hello. <laughs> okay, what do you feel is your obligation to the reader? Oh, okay. Well, as a storyteller, I feel obliged to keep the reader awake half the night, turning pages, just one more chapter. Um, I'm kidding. No, I'm really not kidding. That's what I would love. <laughs> but aside from that, uh, I think that I definitely um, have to entertain the reader to keep them interested. And I want to, more than anything, I want to engage the reader. I don't just want to transport them to a different place, to someone else's little world. I really want them to feel they are right there with them. I want them to feel the experiences, the joy, the angst that the characters are going through. Uh, one reader said to me that when they weren't laughing, they were crying. And I, I was overjoyed by that because I knew they were definitely engaged in the story. So if um, when you're reading Old Broad Road, I want you to feel like you're uh, sitting at Sylvia's table watching her bake beans or prepare a dinner for Carl. I want you rubbing shoulders with Carl and visiting with Kevin. And um, who, one person sent me a message not too long ago saying that they their favorite Kevin their favorite character was Kevin because he was just totally hot. And I thought, wow, I created a character that was totally hot, but. Um, <laughs> But no, I, I'm obliged to uh, make it a good experience for a reader. When they get to that last page, I want them to regret that the book is ending because they want to keep on reading. Mm -hmm. That's the way I feel about it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, over to Jill. Oh, horrific incidents or <laughs> events from childhood that will capture its terror for the reader. Um, how, do you, how do you handle that? How do you reenact that for your readers um, in a fictional story? First of all, I think it's wise to go wherever that particular incident has happened. Um, get a sense of it um, years later, perhaps. It's still there, the building is still there, or in my particular case, the bridge is still there. And if anyone listening has been to the Capilano Canyon Suspension Bridge, you'll know it's a pretty scary bridge. And um, very, very high up, lots of cataracts swirling around behind you. And when the character is really young and they have a sense of terror of that, 
the senses have to be important. What you hear, what you feel as the young girl falls onto the, the slats, the wooden slats, and her, her face is pushed up against the wood, you want to be there too. You want to be that person. So you hear down below, you feel the spray, uh, the sound of the wind in the trees. And, and then if you're lucky, you have photographs or pictures of it that you, in case you can't get to Vancouver, and of course, right now you can't, at least not pro probably very comfortably. Um, so you have a, a chance to visualize it. You have to make it real. And in this particular book, My Life Bridge by Bridge, uh, it's not a self-help book, but it's, I think, a book that is healing and the act of the writing, the process of the writing heals for the characters because they eventually realize that they can cross the bridge, that there is safety on the other side and they can move on with their lives. So the five senses for sure, make it real. Make it real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, over to Joanne. Okay, um, the music in Claudette on the Keys is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but tell me how you use music in this story. Well, the 1930s were a great time of inspiration and in music. Um, many of the standards that we know and love today, such as uh, George Gershwin, Cole Porter's Night and Day, um, Duke Ellington, Fats Waller's Ain't Misbehavin' and Honeysuckle Rose, they're still very familiar and um, loved today. And I always think how thrilling it must have been to play those pieces for the first time. And songs such as Pennies from Heaven and Happy Days Are Here Again, um, they had lyrics that were meant to lift people's spirits because um, it was a difficult time. Many people were out of work and uh, struggling to get their next meal. Um, so they needed an escape. And uh, we might remember a lot of the musicals from that time, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, with such lavish productions and beautiful gowns and dances that, um, that were an escape from uh, the poverty that was prevalent then. And music was uh, quite uh, common to listen to on the radio. People gathered around after supper to listen to, um, you know, concerts and dramas on the radio. There weren't as many distractions back then. So it was uh, quite a, a, a thing that brought people together. Um, and in the book, I was aided by the extensive uh, library of sheet music that my grandparents left behind. Um, so all of the pieces that are mentioned in the book are ones that I found amongst their collection, which in fact, I'm gonna be donating to uh, the University of Toronto Music Archives on Monday. <laughs> Great. Close to a thousand selections. Um, oh. But I sprinkled the dialogue and descriptions um, with musical terminology. So as that would have been how they thought and related to the world and each other, um, as they were, you know, immersed in rehearsing and performing music. And uh, in the 1930s and 40s, also, there was a lot of music, especially composed for um, two pianos. Um, it was a new genre at that time. And sometimes Harry and Claudette would play the same notes, and other times they had completely different parts. Um, but the important thing was to present a unified front starting and ending and at the same time. And I thought it, it was interesting in the book to develop the tension between their professional lives as performers, um, but how they have difficulties in their personal lives as a married couple um, getting along. And one reviewer said that I brought the uh, musical world of Toronto, London and Berlin to life with keenly observed detail. Mm -hmm. So I think, mm -hmm. um, I think I was successful in doing that, I hope. Yes, and you're also you also play. You're the piano. Yes, I yeah I'm not very I'm not a professional, but I do enjoy uh, playing the piano and um, playing some of the sheet music that uh, that they left behind. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, over to Marianne. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you're you're what you are you are writing from Thunder Bay. 
But how right. do you visit the Lucy Maud Montgomery sites in PEI? Yes, I have actually, although it was a long time ago. I think I was only 13 at the time uh, or possibly 14. My parents drove to PEI or they drove and took the ferry across. And um, so my mother and I visited the Anna Green Gables home, of course, and we went to um, the Charlottetown Festival. I was hoping we could see a performance of Anna Green Gables, but what was playing that, that evening was Johnny Belinda, which was wonderful in itself. And I remember being struck by how small the Anna Green Gables home was, which you notice when you look at old historic homes, in the books you imagine them as having these big rambling rooms, but they're actually small spaces. But uh, I, I would like to go again, for sure, and uh, refresh my memory. Okay. Okay, and over to Phyllis. Okay, let's talk about sequels. Was it your intention to produce a sequel when you wrote Old Broad Road? No, it was not my intention at all. I think I was just totally thrilled to have completed a book um, that started out as a what if moment with me when I was visiting Newfoundland. Um, so, no, I just created Sylvia Kramer and I was uh, very happy with her adventures in Old Broad Road and felt that uh, the end of the book was was uh, quite satisfactory and uh, thrilled with it. And then uh, the first readers of the manuscript, uh, one by one came to me and said, you know, I need more. We, we just can't get enough of these characters and, and we wanna see what happens to them next. You can't just leave us here like this. So the characters were still very much alive in my mind and willing to share some more adventures of uh, Chapel's Cove. And so I began writing the sequel. Um, some characters continued on into the sequel and others didn't and uh, were introduced to some new characters. So it was a lot of fun for me to revisit these people as well. And I'm very glad that I was encouraged to write the sequel. And the sequel and Old Broad Road, in my opinion, are both standalone books. But I'm sure anyone who's read Old Broad Road will be most curious and anxious to see what happens to their favorite characters. Okay, thank you. I know I am. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so um, just very quickly, um, in just a couple of words, um, what is next for all of you? And we'll start with Jill. I'm... I've been commissioned by a cousin, 88-year-old woman, and uh, I'm writing her story. It's called The Fourth Sibling, and it's an escape from an abusive marriage, but what it really is about is all the reinventions of her. She was milking cows at five, right, driving tractors at 11. At 16, she was a mother. At 25, she was the first woman for the Alberta Farmers Union, and she became well-known as a breeder of Charlotte cattle through the artificial insemination program of 1956. So she was a lady. She was a lady. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Joanne. Well, uh, music is a thread that uh, ties a lot of my writing together. Um, and as Tina said, my first book, Love in the Air, Second World War Letters, was based on my parents' correspondence when my father was stationed overseas with the um, RCAF band. And uh, Claudette on the Keys, as I've just said, was inspired by my grandparents' lives in music. And the story I'm currently working on is about a young Irish girl whose head is turned by a handsome English widower who plays the flute with the Toronto Symphony. And it's also a blend of fact and fiction, uh, loosely based on the lives of my great grandparents. Okay, thank you. And Marianne, what are you working on? I'm working on a sequel to my murder mystery. Oh. Um, okay. Yes, this one's called Death, in the, Death on the Water. And uh, like the other one, it's set in Thunder Bay, and it has the same two characters, uh, two best friends, Margaret and Louise, 
who solved the first mystery. And uh, yes, I've been having a lot of fun with it. <laughs> okay, and Phyllis. Alrighty, as you can expect, I'm anticipating the release of the sequel for Old Broad Road. I finished a, a psychological thriller. Um, I, I tend to jump from genre to genre, although Old Broad Road is considered by some to be crime. Um, and I also right now I'm working on a cold case mystery novel, and I'm having a lot of fun with that. And that takes place between 1947 and 1953. So having a lot of fun telling the story through flashbacks and doing a lot of great research. Oh, that's great. That's exciting. Yes. Hey, they're all exciting projects. Bravo. Okay. All right. So let's open it up for some questions and answers. Uh, from our, our uh, wonderful audience. Uh, Hi, everybody. I, I'm back again. So we do have at least two questions. So if you just bear with me for a second, I'm just going to uh, pull it up one second. Okay, we've already answered um, Sherry's question about... Uh, oh, here we go. Here, Sherry has a question. I'm going to show that one. Do any of the panelists write in personal journals? I do. And uh, in fact, I think it was just a week ago, I, uh, I delivered a talk on the health benefits of journaling to, um, to a retired teacher sorority. So, uh, but I believe it has a lot more than health benefits. I believe that journaling has benefits for our creative lives and uh, our emotional lives. And I've been doing it for many, many years. Okay, I'll add that I've been journaling most of my life as well. And um, I have stacks of journals. And um, I think as well that it's very good for your mental health to be journaling. I think it's not only the actual, um, the, well, the physical handwriting. I think you're focused so much on that action that your brain is really far more creative than it would be if you were just on a computer screen. And I think emotionally that's very good. And I also believe it's almost meditative as you write. Yeah, I agree. And I think, and it helps me to figure out what I'm thinking about <laughs> because mm. otherwise I don't really know. Yeah. And sometimes uh, it ends up in a story, but more often than not, it's just there and it, you know, it just helps me to clarify my thoughts. Yeah, and I'm hoping nothing in my journal ends up in a story. <laughs> <laughs> Great, that was an excellent okay. question. <laughs> okay, and then we've got a question from Claire. I'll just pop that up. Could we have a pricey of Old Broad Road? So I'm not sure if she's wondering if it's available maybe on the website. Phil, uh, Phyllis, did you do um, you, and have an excerpt? I can't remember. It's well, on the website. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so if you check out the website. Um, oh, Tina, Sorry, Phyllis. Go ahead. No, that's okay. That's okay. It's on Crossfield's website. I, I was just going to say much has been said about Old Broad Road. Or I'm sure you've gathered enough about the story uh, just from what I've said in my answers. But just very quickly, if I could add. Um, in a psychological roller coaster of events, Sylvia Kramer finally reconciles with her estranged family when a brutal assault shatters her spirit and plunges her back into depression. Unorthodox coping mechanisms aid her recovery, but it will take more than out of body experiences and superstitious tattoos to heal the damage. So that gives it a little bit of a different dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. And then we've got another question here. Uh, so the question is from Leo. Do you often have more than one book in the writing process? That's for anyone to answer. Well, um, what uh, a lot of people don't, don't know is that Maud and me took over uh, two decades for me to write. Um. and. I really, I felt that it was so important to me that that was adding to my stress and I often put it away and would go to writing something else for a while and I would keep returning to it. But uh, now that I've completed that, I hope I can stick with one thing for a while. 
quite often you take a class or a writing workshop and you have a brilliant concept of a book and then you get started and even though you're working on something else you know that like I have a folder sitting on my desk right now it's the next book I've only outlined it but I know it's there waiting for me so yes the answer is definitely yes to that <laughs> yeah when inspiration strikes I know when I was writing one of my other novels I couldn't get an idea out of my head yeah. Um, and I tried and I thought, well, maybe if I just write one chapter, the first chapter, then I'll be able to. But sometimes I'll write a novel and then leave it to write something else and then go back to do some proofing, editing, that kind of thing, rewriting. So sometimes there are more than one book that's um, mm -hmm. that's on the go at the same time. I, yeah, I, I had started Claudette on the Keys just as Love in the Air was being edited. I found I, I couldn't really write both at once, but once the previous book was far enough along um, in the editing process, I felt I could turn to uh, to the new one. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think we'll move to the next question. This is from Claire. Um, is anyone a cross-genre creative, for example, with art? I know that um, Joanne has mentioned that she does play the piano, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I know some people are doing memoir and fiction, you know, so maybe uh, Tina could direct how this is answered or or anyone can pop, pop, pop in well, and answer that. As anyone well. can pop in. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, I, I, I am a musician and... Uh, um, I play the piano and, and sing and have conducted choir professionally. I don't do that so much anymore. I always also love to act and, uh, and I've written and directed plays. So I would say theater and music and, uh, and novels and poetry have always been my favorites. Yeah, I guess that's it. Well, I had shared last time when we were chatting that I took my one of my stories from uh, Thistles to Cow Pies and I wrote it into a screenplay, which is something I, I don't do very often. It's such a different way of writing, but it was so much fun and it's going to be performed in 2022 along with four other plays here in Lundberg. Great. Congratulations. That's really great. Okay. That's wonderful. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Uh, and this is from Grace. Do your writers think that cursive writing is important in the creative process? And do you think the next generation needs that? I That's absolutely do. <laughs> no, it's not tough for me. I've always felt that way. I do think <laughs> cursive is important in the creative process. I really do. And um, absolutely the next generation needs to learn cursive. Um, it's very important. I mean, how will they do research from all those years ago if they don't even know what they're reading? It'll look like hieroglyphics to them. Um, so, yeah, I think it is very important to continue with cursive. Mm -hmm. And it slows them down. Mm -hmm. Yes, you mentioned that point. before, I think, too, Jill. You, you intimated right. that. And that is true, yeah. yeah. And I think even if you don't write yourself, like just to read letters from, mm -hmm. you know, 20 or 30 years ago, like you have to be able to um, understand cursive writing. And I guess mm -hmm. they don't teach it in schools anymore. So, I'm Well, they do. They yeah, that. they do. Oh, they do? Yeah, the teacher has to be the one who's in charge of it. And for the Friends of Sable Island, we do, um, we have a summer student every year that is going back and transcribing the logs from the 1850s and they're moving all the way through it. And one of the things they have to prove they can do, you give them a letter. In one of the cases, it's my great grandfather's handwriting and you have to be able to translate it. You need wow. that for the job. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think that's it for the questions. So Tina, I guess um, we'll go to the, the book ordering information now. Yes, please. Okay, so what I'm gonna just do is all everybody on the screen is gonna disappear for a minute because I'm going to, um, to put an overlay with the ordering information, but Tina will be able to speak over that. So just give me a moment, please. All right. Uh, mm. Okay, um, these are the four, uh, the four novels that we featured 
along with their authors uh, this evening. Um, Claudette on the Keys, Maud and Me, Old Broad Road, and From Thistles to Cow Pies. These books are available through Chapters Indigo and can also be ordered from your local uh, book retailer. Um, our distributor is Fitzhenry Whiteside, and um, any, any bookseller would know how to order the books. You can also order direct uh, from me at crossfieldpublishing.com. I'm living in St. Mary's and um, I can certainly get a book out to you. We're also in the process of creating some eBooks uh, for our authors and uh, there'll be more information about that uh, probably in the, in the next month. Okay, so and that's also the, I'm oh, just going to jump in with a little yeah. plug here. <laughs> that's, and, uh, it's live. Do whatever you like. I'm just here to facilitate. Um, my memoir, Hazards of the Trade, is also available from Cross Village. Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes. It so, is. Um, so I just wanted to put that little plug in there for Hazards of the Trade. And uh, yeah, that's it. Great. And, yeah. and I'd like to plug Hazards of the Trade because I did the first two edits of it. There you go. <laughs> it was my first professional editing job with Crossfield Publishing, so I loved it. I must say. <laughs> yes, you can you can find all of my authors on CrossfieldPublishing.com. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, Tina, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before I start to wind down? Uh, just, I'd like to uh, to thank my my guest panelists. Um, ah. I've had a lot of fun working with you and, and will do so again in the future. You, you are a wonderful group. Um, thank you, Glenda, for being my producer. Um, exactly when we need help, Glenda's there. <laughs> it, it's been, just as an aside from uh, myself, to, uh, you know, this is one of the things that happens as a result of COVID. Uh, poor Phyllis. I had I had edited her book and then I went through the final process with Tina and the book designer and we were all ready to have her book launch at a, at a store uh, and boom, everything closed down and uh, we all were, were caught off guard. And uh, as a result of it, though, in a very strange way, I, I can't go out to the physical book launches for all of our authors. But lo and behold, we had no choice but to go virtual. I learned how to use the StreamYard platform, and now I'm an, you know, an online event producer, and I'm able to attend the, the launches because I'm producing. <laughs> and I've, I, I, but what we've also decided, though, is that, I mean, in some of the cases that um, you'll see that we've had authors that are now getting back into doing physical launches, and recently, Tina and I produced uh, Joanne's wonderful launch for Clotted on the Keys, and she's been very busy out on the road at the same time as um, we did a, a virtual launch, too. And there's such a, a lifespan of the production after the fact because it's recorded and it can be shared on all of our social media again. It can just, um, it'll live forever. Plus, there's a transcript, so if people have issues with... Um, with a hearing or anything they can read the the transcript it's a little bit more accessible in some ways and of course people can come from anywhere and we've had i think someone today from austin texas so it's uh, mm -hmm. it's a very exciting time to be able to provide this service for tina and her authors and um anyway so i think what we're going to do next as we wind down is tina has created um, just a little, some uh, edited clips from an interview that she had. So she's created a little book trailer and I'm going to share my uh, Chromecast, sorry, my uh, Chrome tab uh, to have the YouTube video play right now. And basically everybody can kind of wave and say goodbye now. This is your chance authors to, and Tina to say goodbye to everyone. And I'm, I'm thanking Thanks all so of the- to everyone who attended, it was great. And I, I'm yeah. thanking all of the attendees on, on Tina and on behalf of Tina and Jill, Joanne, Marianne and Phyllis and, and myself, because without the viewers, um, this wouldn't, there'd be no point in having this kind of a virtual event. And we've had up to 30 eyeballs on us today. Oh, that's um, excellent. And if we didn't get to a question that you think about afterwards, please just continue to put it in the YouTube um, comment section because we have access to that. Tina and I have access to the Crossfield YouTube channel. 
and um, and we'll make sure that uh, you get answered there. And also go to the Facebook page for Crossfield Publishing, uh, where news of future events will be. And make sure you sign up and like each of these authors' pages. Um, so anyway, so that's about it then. So if you want to audience hang in there for just a little bit longer, we've still got 20 people with us. I'm going to play this YouTube uh, trailer. It's just a minute and a half long. And you'll know that the event, is uh, the event is finishing when I put that book ordering information up again. And then I'm just going to say, okay, that's it. So okay. goodbye, everybody. And Bye. Uh, get the Bye. trailer. Thank start. you. Okay. How many authors do you have? I have 22. Oh, I don't know if that's, if that's, There's always somebody oh, hang on a, a second. Book. Can you take any more? Off? All right. One second. Little glitch. I forgot to share my screen. Okay. So I just have to share screen, my Chrome tab. And then we'll go. There we go. Okay. I'm going to just back that up. How many authors do you have? I have 22, but it's growing. There's always somebody that has a book. Can you take any more authors? I am worried. <laughs> I have authors saying, oh, I've written the second book. And I'm thinking, oh, really? That's great. <laughs> there will be people watching this program that feel that they have a book that they would like to get published. Uh, what do you do when they bring you their manuscript? Well, you, you have to accept the work that, that went into it. And so an author to sit down and write something cover to cover, uh, it takes a lot to do that. And I think it, it deserves a lot of respect. Uh, maybe it's not publishable right now. Um, maybe it never will be. Um, maybe it's the greatest book that's ever come along. But you have to give it a chance. And so authors deserve that chance to have a book at least looked at or reviewed at some point. Um, it, that could happen in a number of different ways. It doesn't have to be a publisher, but to have an editor look at it and say, yeah, there's some really good material here, but you could improve it by doing these few things and maybe then sub submit it to a publisher. Truthfully, most manuscripts that come to me are not ready. And I need to invest money to help them be ready. And that involves doing a lot of extra footwork. Okay, everybody. So we're going to sign off now. I'm going to put back the ordering uh, information. And then we'll just wave goodbye. And I'll be ending the broadcast very shortly. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. And we'll see you the next time. Okay, that's it then. Good night.